felt the need to talk a bit about the podcast Harris had uh, a couple of days ago. He brought on William McCaskill, one of the founders of Effective Altruism, you know, co-founders, and really the leading figures. Uh, I think his book is the most often cited reason as to why people got into the EA movement. So he's done a lot of good stuff. I am not impressed by this podcast the two of them did. First few minutes were impressive. And then they got into, they, they really revealed just how much of a boner they have for moral convention. And now they're going to cloak it as though they have, they have boners for moral convention for instrumental reasons. But I don't think that's what's at play here. I think, especially when they got into stuff like um, uh, organ transplants, and talked about how it's, um, we don't want to live in the sort of society where your organ can be plucked out of your system just like that. But of course, thought experiments about organ transplants aren't meant to be viewed in a non-isolated way, which is why it's always better to do a sort of negative-minded alternative to the sort of positive-minded um, quest to save lives. So instead, what I like to do anytime someone brings up the organ transplant horseshit is flip it so that mad scientist kidnaps like six individuals and it's a sort of mad scientist who can't tell a lie and he says he's gonna torture five of the six individuals unless you dear observer torture one of them now let's say he's gonna torture them for like five hours unless you torture one of them for five minutes right, and the moment you torture the one for five minutes he let all all six go and for some practical reasons you can't just let the person go as you're torturing him and you can't explain to him that you are torturing him because by doing so it'll only last for five minutes and he'll get to go and the other five will get to go you can't explain anything to this sixth person that the mad scientist is asking you to torture let's say he's a, he's a deaf mute and he can't read lips or anything. he's blind he's got the Helen Keller thing going on uh, but he can still feel torture all every, every bit as much as the other five um, so that's the proper way to set up these organ transplant things because when you get to saving lives, you get into the ricochet effects and all that jazz and it just goes nowhere. It's just got a bunch of uncertainty built into it. But then, seemingly, the two of them uh, th th thought it interesting to discuss organ transplants. Um, also, something was brought up about the dead grandmother and whether she deserves a proper funeral uh, and whether an effective altruist can justify giving grandmother proper funeral because hey the grandmother's dead she can't suffer anymore so why the fuck would you give her a funeral um, and of course the fact that she can't suffer right now doesn't mean that you can't violate her preferences right now in a post-mortem sort of way so if grandma wanted a funeral by all means grandma should get a funeral uh, just one of those other goals that you can fulfill for her irrespective of the fact that she's not here to experience that goal being fulfilled um, but of course if you're an EA, you have to ask the question, well, just how lucrative, just how fancy of a funeral does grandma want? And they didn't bother to ask that question. So if grandma wants a frugal funeral, that's fine. It's not really going to deplete the savings of the EA. Like, so in my case, I'm always thinking savings because I'm always thinking investment and doing the post-mortem donation myself um, so that I can remove a lot of the um, fiscal future worries over my own ability to continue living in a cutthroat job market, right? So, frugal funeral versus extravagant funeral. What does grandma want? Grandma wants the frugal funeral, by all means. Fulfill grandma's wishes. Grandma wants something more. Um, I don't think it's in any way justifiable to um, spit in the face of that many kids drowning in shallow ponds, figuratively speaking. Um, just to fulfill this insane wish grandma had. Uh, but they didn't even cloak it in terms of preferences. They just thought the relationship in and of itself. So even if grandma, like you listen to them, you, you could always infer that even if grandma had no point requested, or like expressed the least bit of a concern over how she is disposed of, whether you chuck her in the trash, whether you do anything. Like if grandma truly does not care what happens to her after she dies, What's the argument for spending any amount of resources on her relative to, compared to, resulting in ignoring the shallow pond kid or 
the kid after the first kid, right? Because as they, as they admit toward the end, there's always an eggshell shallow pond. Every step you take, there's a shallow pond. And you have to internalize that. And they were willing to internalize it toward the end of the podcast, especially Harris. And he says, he even said perfection is unattainable, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try your best. Okay. But then if you're going to talk about grandma's preferences, you really should specify um, that there's a cutoff point at some, at, at some point. You gotta, you gotta cut off unreasonable preferences, like an extravagant funeral costing tens of thousands of dollars, just like we would for an extravagant wedding. Doesn't mean the marriage is gonna be less um, um, beneficial to you just because you refuse to have the extravagant wedding, right? Now, if you're not an EA, well, like, by all means, don't take these issues seriously at all. Do whatever the fuck you want. But within the confines of EA, I don't see how any of these issues can be taken seriously. And they discuss them as though they're controversial. I don't get it whatsoever. So they did that. Uh, what else did they do? Um, you know what? I'm just going to play a bit here because when they got to the population ethics part, it got really cringeworthy. Um, they were trying to salvage the repugnant conclusion, which is... Um, pretty much the view that if you have trillions of individuals living just marginally above the this is a life worth living level, um, which I'm not even sure if they try to impose some sort of generic hedonic barrier to, or if they allow for some sort of idiosyncratic preference barrier, um, it sounded kind of like they were leaning toward a hedonic application of that, but um, I'd probably have to re-listen to that part to fully confirm that. Um, so the, the repugnant conclusion, they were actually sort of making quasi-apologetics for it. They said that you can't really just write it off. Like, it's intuitively unappealing. And they even said that, um, at one point they said, common sense, like people believe that the common sense view in ethics is to make happy people, oh, oh no, sorry, is to make people happy and it's not to make happy people. And I don't know what the fuck planet they're living on. Procreation is as venerated today as it's been ever since I can remember. Um, so that totally threw me off guard. Do you think the common sense view in both folk morality and in systematized ethics discourse is that what we ought to do is make people happy and not make happy people. Uh, it's, just, it's just the furthest thing from the common sense view in my experience, and in my experience of reading moral philosophers. That's why such a tiny percent of moral philosophers are axiological negativists and negative consequentialists. Um, but anyway, I'm going to play a bit here, and uh, this is past the repugnant conclusion, um, the, the quantity over quality on steroids view. Um, now they're going to get into some really interesting stuff, and it was just so poorly done I'm just going to take a few minutes here and play it. I just like to play it, but it's taking a while because it's, it's slow. It's very warm in here, so the computer takes a while to, for the play to kick in. I'll probably edit this out. It's taking too damn long. Why is it taking this long? And if I don't edit it out, my apologies. I'm just too damn lazy. I didn't have this long a pause before when I was prepping, so... Um, I... um, but then over time, I mean, just... Firstly, the thought of just, yeah, well, what are the, some of the most important things for human civilization to be doing? Well, one is just not committing suicide as, um, you know, as a species. It seems like actually kind of common sense that would be the most bizarre so. Yeah. Um, but then over time, I mean, just... Firstly, the thought of just, yeah, well... What are the, some of the most important things for human civilization to be doing? Well, one is just not committing suicide as, um, you know, as a species. It seems like... And that's such a scuzzy way of putting it. There's no way seven billion individuals can commit suicide. I don't know why every now and then people trot out this stupid suicide, rosy terminology when it's just, it's just never going to happen. Seven billion individuals decide at the same time to view life is not worth living from here on out. No, I think you're talking about something else. So, 
No romantic language, please. Actually, kind of common sense that, that would be a really important priority. Um, helping to ensure that this, the human story continues into the future. Um, you know, we talk but of course, the human story is not the only story, and I'm the first to grant that humans have future-oriented interests. They have forward-looking preferences. Uh, not all humans, of course. Infants don't. Uh, you can almost, almost make an argument that toddlers really don't, at least not informed forward-looking preferences. Uh, they have non-informed forward-looking preferences. And then there's a sort of sliding scale effect at which point they do become uh, forward-looking in some sort of reasonable sense. Um, the comatose don't have forward-looking preferences. Um, mentally retarded folks don't really have it in any meaningful sense. So it's, it's a subset of humanity, the subset that qualifies for personhood. Those have both hedonic interests and non-hedonic interests. Um, so it's a subset of humanity, and that's it. Like No other species, whether it's a subset or the entire species, every last organism within the species, no other species has forward-looking preferences. It's just us. So if we're going to phrase this in terms of a tug of war, um, we're outnumbered. Most people are going to say that uh, like my position here consists of the, um, the, the, the lunatic French position, but that's only because they tacitly are assuming that animals have future-oriented interests. I don't see how they can make that argument. The animal lives purely on instinct. The animal cannot conceive of the risk equations it has been thrust into. Um, the animal's a slave to its DNA. So the only way to wrong an animal is to hurt an animal. There's two ways to wrong a human being, loosely speaking. To hurt a human being or to thwart a human being's preference or to actualize their dispreference, as I would be more fond of putting it that way, um, irrespective of whether it interferes with some sort of mental state or not. Like spying is, is an example I like to apply. Um, but in, in any event, uh, you, gotta, you have to phrase this debate along the lines of a tug of war between those who prioritize the wish to avoid the negative, speaking on behalf of the animals who don't have forward-looking preferences, right? So your, your intergenerational, intergalactic colonization fun fest is going to drag them along too, even though you can't make a sensible argument for why they should be dragged along. Um, so it's, it's that sort of tug of war between the supermajority of non-human species, the subset of humanity that are incapable of forming informed forward-looking preferences, um, and those of us, and I'm, I'm including myself as somebody who is capable of those forward-looking preferences, I don't want to die, even though if it's painless, um, but then we got to think about it in terms of the package deal. And we also got to think about it in terms of involuntary torture level suffering that we know, just as a statistical inevitability, will happen to millions, if not billions, and trillions, if we count around the animals, of organisms due to the stamp of approval that McCaskill and Harris are, um, they're, they're beating around the bush, but it's pretty much a straightforward way of saying all that future suffering, torture level, involuntary, it'll be worth it because at some point down the road, AI will be finalized and we're going to have the bestest of best experiences for those far future generations. And I'm not just, I'm just saying that that road is paved with a bit, a bit too much. And uh, that's an understatement, a lot too much, negative. And if one of the two of them were to endure it even for 10 minutes, um, I think they'd be, they'd be screaming for a reversal preference opportunity. Like if you gave them the brazen bull, um, something Brian Tomasic brought up in an excellent video that I'm going to link in the description section, right? So, so like 10 minutes of the brazen bull for some eternity paradise. Um, maybe I'd be willing to step into it because I think, well, it's just 10 minutes, it's nothing. But I'm fairly certain that a couple of minutes in, or hell, even a few seconds in, I'd be knocking, begging to get the fuck out of it. And I'm pretty sure these two guys would. And technically, a second here when I play this next clip. And once again, it's paused. Even though I click play, 
because it's very warm in here and I should probably edit this out. Uh, but I might just get too damn lazy to do so. So, I don't know. While it's doing that, let me read a segment here on lexicographic preferences because that's what all of this boils down to. There's just some forms of suffering that there is no adequate payoff toward. And we know as a matter of statistical inevitability this inter environmental stewardship. Um, so I'm just going to pause him again. Now he started playing, but I'm about to start reading this. Um, we know there's just no adequate payoff to. So I'll link this wiki page. It's called Lexicographic Preferences. And those are preferences that describe comparative preferences where an economic agent prefers any amount of one good, X, to any amount of another, Y. Specifically, if offered several bundles of goods, the agent will choose the bundle that offers the most X, no matter how much Y there is. Only when there is a tie between bundles with regard to the number of units of X will the agent, comparing the number of units of Y across bundles, will the agent start, sorry, will the agent start comparing the number, number of units of Y across bundles. Lexicographic preferences extend utility theory analogously to the way that non-standard infinitesimals extend real numbers. With lexicographic preferences, the utility of certain goods is infinitesimal in comparison to others. For example, if for a given bundle, x, y, z, an agent orders his preferences according to the rule x greater than y greater than z, then the bundles 5, 3, 3, 5, 1, 6, 5, 3, 5 would be ordered from most to least preferred. Number 1, 5, 3, 3, number 2. 516, number 3, 535. Five. Even though the first option contains the fewer total goods than the second option, it is preferred because it has more y. Note that the number of x's is the same, and so the agent is comparing y's. Even though the third option has the same total goods as the first option, the first option is still preferred. Even though the third option has far more y units than the second option, the second option is still preferred because it has slightly more x. And you're going to need a visual of this, and I might incorporate a visual of it onto the screen unless I get lazy. And so that's what I'm trying to get at when I'm talking about intolerable levels of suffering that are simply not fungible with top-tier positives. Um, and I don't see these guys volunteering to endure the worst of the worst to actualize this mission. I don't even see them bringing up the concept to begin with. Instead, they bring up the most simplistic, if we can kill everyone overnight, painlessly, um, people who disagree with us think that that wouldn't be a bad thing. Well, it would have features of badness for those individuals who didn't want to die, myself included. But again, you're, you're, just, not, you're just not discussing it seriously. To discuss it seriously, you have to discuss it as a tug of war. So again, it's paused. My apologies. Um, this is what I get for still filming videos in the summer when it's boiling hot in here and the laptop's being a piece of shit. So I'm going to try to edit this out, but no promises. God, that's taken forever. Maybe I'll read a bit more from this wiki article. I just see preserving the planet for future generations. This is just that. Uh taken even more seriously again. Yeah. And similarly, you know, we when we watch disaster movies like Deep Impact and movies about uh, asteroids hitting and so on, you know, it's just uncontroversial. Of course, it's of crucial importance to blow up this asteroid and save everyone, uh, save everyone on the planet. <laughs> what is this? The argument from cinematic sentimentalism. I mean, fuck, you're supposed to be against sentimentalism. You've written a book against it. Fairly impressive book. Part of the reason for that is because of the, because it's important to, you know, achieve all the things we're going to achieve in the future. Um, I do think it it's important relative to there being some reasonable, minimal opportunity cost of doing so. I don't know why they can discuss this. I don't know how they can discuss it without even touching on the elephant in the room. Like, I don't even care if people disagree in the end. I'm just struck by the fact that they can discuss it seemingly in some 
at least semblance of depth, but not get to the nitty gritty, not get to that gigantic motherfucking elephant in the room. Things that they themselves would not be willing to endure that they know on some level they're putting a stamp on others enduring down the road. At some point during the intergenerational, intergalactic fun ride. People, some people have an intuition though that what is important certainly in ethics is just not causing suffering or mitigating suffering and so that if you could concoct a scenario you can do a pluralist application of that and still order it as being more important than other values. So I don't know why you just said the only thing, right? So instead of saying the only thing, how about the most important thing? The thing we prioritize above other values. Doesn't mean we completely neglect all other values across all circumstances. It just means insofar as right now there are intolerable levels of suffering taking place we focus on those first and foremost. Now, if you want to hear that and ultimately disagree, fine, but don't tell me that because I'm willing to, to focus on those things first and foremost, that that's the only thing I care about, ethically speaking. It's not the only thing I care about, it's just the first thing I care about. Oh, it's paused again! Jesus fucking Christ! Oh, I really should have done this some other day, but... I was listening to this and I said, God damn it, these guys need a response ASAP. So, maybe I'll read a bit more from the wiki article. A distinctive feature of such lexicographic preferences is that the of an agent's preferences does not map onto a real valued range. Where the lights just go out. Right? So, you know, what's wrong with all of us dying in our sleep tonight painlessly? Well, it's, it's clearly not a matter of suffering because it's painlessly. So. Some people, I think... Yeah, it's the fact that some individuals have life goals. And if those life goals do not interfere in a direct, you know, like in a straightforward way, or even in a roundabout way, right? if it doesn't result in any sort of causal chain that goes on to generate the sort of suffering that I'm pretty sure you would not be willing to generate, then yes, none of those people should be offed. But if the only way for an individual who is, let's say, trapped in a well and is slowly freezing to death and has no way to off himself and like the only way for a bullet to connect with his head is if at some point before getting to his head it has to connect through my head, then even though I don't want to off myself, even though there's a lot of goals I want to accomplish, even though there's a lot of stuff that I want to actualize, I'm finding it hard to say that that injustice done to me would be impermissible, given the slow, tedious, unspeakably horrible method of dying that that other individual has to endure. Why not bring up a scenario like that? Why make it really simplistic? Have a sense, a, it's a, obviously a, quite a nihilistic one, but a sense that a nihilistic one. So I think, I hope, that here, by nihilistic, he is referring to existential nihilism, not meta-ethical nihilism, like second-order ethical analysis. Like we're, this, this is supposed to be a normative discussion, a.k.a. first-order ethical discussion. Meta-ethics, second-order ethics. Normative ethics, first-order ethics. So I hope he's simply referring to existential nihilism. And no, one doesn't have to be an existential nihilist to believe that the levels of hardship and horror in existence right now, in circulation right now, um, are too high a price to pay. Agree or disagree, that's secondary. The point is that one doesn't have to be an existential nihilist to believe that. I'm pretty sure if I made things a billion times worse for every single individual that he would see that there's some sense to this view and that one doesn't have to be an existential nihilist to believe that we ought to just pack it in. And it's paused again, so I'm just going to return to the wiki article, which is kind of disjointed at this point and kind of useless. 
Um, in terms of real valued utility, one would say that the utility of x and y is infinitesimal compared with z, and the utility of z is infinitesimal compared to y. The model of real numbers is always logically ambiguous. One is allowed to adjoin infinitesimal qu quantities to make a non-standard model. Standard models of the real numbers exclude infinitesimals. Well, there's not actually something wrong with that. It's like that from it's only our parochialism that makes us feel like there's something wrong with that. But as we've just nothing wrong with it in isolation. There's something wrong with it when it involves other individuals in interpersonal hellholes. Suggested the other side of the of the ledger is all of the good that never gets done, all of the happiness yeah. that never gets lived as a result of that cancellation. In fact, if we live as species for billions of years and migrate to populate the, the stars, the vast majority of good experiences are in the future. And, and, to, and to pull the stopper on, on those is to cancel in advance all of the creativity and insight and beauty that could be enjoyed. So, I mean, you have to care. And to cancel out and prevent all the negative flip sides that, on some level, I'm sure he knows he just hand-waved by not referencing it on some level, maybe a subconscious level, um, but it's really scuzzy of him not to really have the debate in a more um, non-shallow context. About that in order to care about existential risk, otherwise, otherwise you're just, then your concern is really just how painful it might be to get hit by an asteroid or suffer some other collision with reality that kills us. Yeah. Kills us. Well, no, you can still care about existential risk um, you know, for the personhood reasons. And at the same time, because as I've referenced in many videos in the past, um, humanity for the past four and a half decades has inadvertently contributed a net benefit to wild animal suffering, has decreased wild animal suffering since about 1970 onwards. It's been sliced in, I want to say half, but I'm having some second, I'm having some doubts about it being 50%, uh, they say 50% species, but we can't count species and organisms interchangeably. So it might be somewhere between 35%, 45%, uh, that initial estimate uh, the WWF, the World Wildlife Fund, uh, came out with in 2014, um, counted species. So they overshot a bit, or at least my interpretations overshot a bit, because I applied it to individual sentient organisms which is the number we're actually after. Um, other organizations are doing um, thorough research to try to figure out exactly to what extent we have positively um, reduced wild animal suffering, reduced might makes right, reduced um, predator-prey ongoings in um, horrific habitats, natural habitats. Um, but even if we only reduced it by 5%, since 1970, that's enough reason to want humanity to stick around and continue with the extractivism, continue with all the wonderful stuff we're doing that's inadvertently destroying predators and uh, resulting in less ouchies in the natural habitat. Well, so yeah, so I think that, I mean, there are some people who have that kind of nihilistic bent, but once you start asking... It's not a nihilistic bent! Jesus fucking Christ! You don't have to be an existential, you don't have to believe all well, I mean, strictly speaking, cosmic meaning is horseshit, but you don't have to shit on personal meaning um, when an individual is truly not responsible in any sort of causal chain way uh, to contribute to horrific suffering or horrific dispreference violation. That certainly gets a thumbs up for me, that person's existence. That individual finds personal meaning in his own existence. Um, that's not something I have to boo. It's not necessarily something I have to say yay toward, but it's not something I'm going to boo. I'm going to yay it before I boo it. Um, so, I just really find it bizarre that they felt the need to throw in this nihilism stuff. Well, supposing your mom died painlessly tonight, would you feel sad about that? Would you think there's a loss because they weren't able to continue to live? And most people say yes, like well, in my own case, yeah, I would not want to die painlessly tonight because of, not because it's going to be going to suffer, but because of the loss of the benefits. That <laughs> and that's why all the brazen bull-esque experiences are worth it. <laughs>